Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming and joining this webinar. Um, I'm Deb, and I'll share my bio in a sec. But before I do that, I just wanted to um, welcome you all to this webinar called Staying Healthy and Active During COVID-19. So we did do one similar to this a while back. And now with the second wave, we wanted to come back to this um, topic again and see how everybody's doing and feeling about it um, with the second wave. And I'd also uh, like to thank Abbott, Lily, Medtronic, Novo Nordisk, and Ipsamed for sponsoring uh, tonight's webinar. Um, it's really great to have your support. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm Deb. You might have seen me before. I've been involved with uh, Diabetes Hope Foundation for a long time. I was, I think, one of the first scholarship recipients uh, way back when uh, the foundation was founded. And uh, I love being part of this. Uh, I have had type 1 diabetes for about 25 years. I'm living in Ottawa and I'm a registered dietitian and personal trainer. And um, I see a lot of clients uh, specializing in sport nutrition here in Ottawa. I have two little kids. And um, so that takes up a lot of my time. And it's definitely been interesting during COVID. So we've all <laughs> had our own experiences. Um, I was also diagnosed with celiac uh, two years ago, so that's another um, part of my practice that I've been sort of uh, growing um, and, and sort of getting to know other, other celiacs. I think we have one on the panel tonight, so um, just lots of different things, and uh, I'm really excited to be here and moderate this and introduce you to some of our other great uh, scholarship recipients. Um, and I'll take you over to Isa, who's our other moderator, and she's going to introduce herself. Hello, good evening. Uh, really, it is such an honor to be here today uh, with my, my fellow co-moderator, Deborah, but really with the rock stars that we have on the call right now. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for 26 years. Uh, definitely has been a journey, but I, I'm always so thankful that there's a group of DHF uh, stars that are, are with me on this journey. Uh, and really, I, I've been involved with DHF for about 10 years now. Uh, so in 2010, I received the Jessica Patrick Memorial Scholarship. And since then, I've been involved um, in our scholarship ceremonies. I supported uh, a few engagements um, with Barb and the team. And the most important thing that, that I really have gained from this is a few friends um, that I hope are joining in on uh, our, our session, our webinar today. Uh, currently, I live in Barrie, Ontario. It's a little bit chilly here if you want to come join us. Uh, and I have a clinical background uh, in dietetics uh, and a certified diabetes educator, but I have recently moved into a different position where I am supporting a hospital and implementing a new electronic health record. So enough of that, uh, enough about me, because we have an exciting topic, uh, which is really about moving our bodies, uh, staying healthy, and, and really discussing what has worked for us um, in wave one uh, of COVID and, and maybe the lessons that we've learned. Uh, so really engaging in physical activity can be difficult. Um, and I hear you during the COVID world and as it's getting colder, it can be quite hard. Um, but it really has a huge impact on our health, um, whether it be our physical health, our mental health, and really how we, we manage and live with our diabetes. Um, so there's also other tools available to, to manage maybe even uh, stress, but uh, today's goal is really to discuss together how physical activity can help us um, with our diabetes and how that may look like uh, with wave two of COVID. Thanks, Isa. It's so, it's so cool to hear about everybody's backgrounds. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, you know, we're heading into November, 
what is it? I've lost count, like the 10th month of 10. <laughs> I don't know. It's a long, it's been a long time. There's been a lot of ups and downs, I think, through COVID um, from when it started to, you know, the initial shock of it all. We've been learning more about the disease and how it's transferred. And I think we're, you know, in some ways we're maybe feeling more anxious about it. And some, in some ways we might be feeling less anxious about it. I think probably there's some individualization to, to that and, and everybody's various situations. I know, you know, Barb and Barb, we were just talking about how it's, you know, impacting her socially and, and her social life and her stress levels around it. And, you know, not knowing when this is going to end and, uh, you know, how to stay on track and how to stay in our routine and how to stay comfortable. So um, that's, that's, I think, what we're going to be sort of chatting about and seeing how the panelists here have been, you know, coping with that and managing that and, and sharing their stories about their successes and, and their challenges. And I encourage you all to get on to the chat and we really want to hear from you because that's what this is all about and ask your questions. And so, you know, so that we can also respond. Um, and so maybe, uh, you know, I'll just sort of, I'll move into maybe just introducing the panelists that we have tonight. So we've got uh, Janet, who's a fellow Ottoan or Otto Ottonian, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we've got Mark. So if you guys want to wave when I call your name, so we know <laughs> who we're talking about here. We've got Mikhail and we've also got Luca who is coming from uh, BC where it's a little bit warmer than it is here. So I'm, less, I'm a little bit jealous, I have to be honest. Um, so, so maybe uh, Janet, can we start with you uh, to, to start off with introducing yourself? Sure, so as Deb mentioned, I'm also in Ottawa, Ontario. I've been type one for almost 26 years. So I'm slowly gaining up on ESA. <laughs> I received my scholarship in 2011 and have been involved with DHF in different capacities, such as the mentoring program, scholarship ceremonies. And I've been on a few of these webinars as well. I currently work for Health Canada as a scientific project coordinator. And on, in my spare time, I decided to become a fitness instructor. So I also have that happening on the side as a hobby as well. So I'm excited to hear from all of the panelists as well and share our inputs tonight. Yeah, so hey everyone, my name is Mark. Um, I've been involved with DHF since about 2013. Um, I'm a 2015 scholarship recipient for the uh, BMO Financial Group Scholarship. Um, and I'm in my final term in accounting and finance at Waterloo. So feel free to ask me any question. Um, about how I've been dealing with uh, school online and, and whatnot. Hi, my name is Luca. Uh, I'm also a fellow Ottawan. This is my first time, first year outside of Ottawa, so I'm very happy to be here, albeit things are a bit different with everything that's going on. I graduated from the University of Ottawa last June uh, with a background in biomedical sciences, and now I'm completing a master's in data science, hopefully be able to look at numbers and predict the future. Let's see, that's simple as I can put it. Um, so in my spare time, when I'm not studying, I like to just go running or climbing or do anything physical. And in a way, to, because all of these clubs on campus are closed, uh, Buddy and I have created a small casual running group where we can meet other fellow casual runners and just go for social distance jogs outside and kind of help to have a little bubble on campus since. Here in Kelowna, where I'm staying now, the campus is a little bit outside of the city. So the students that live here are truly kind of isolated from the city in to a good degree. So yeah, running anything that lets me focus my energy and a lot of coffee. Coffee's a part of me now. There we go. <laughs> I'll go last. So my name is Mikhail. I live in Toronto and I joined DHF, I think, in 2011. Uh, graduated in 2015, so I've been sort of out in the workforce for the last five years. And my specialization really is uh, in business, specifically in finance. So currently I work for a fairly small asset management firm um, 
and you know the simplest way I can pull what I what we do is we, we look at stocks and we we buy them and they hope we, they go up. Uh, of course, the reality is much more complex than that, but that's kind of what it boils down to, to in the end. So I'm happy to discuss anything and everything as it pertains to sort of, uh, I guess, this type of lifestyle and this type of job. But, you know, the quick punchline really is that uh, as someone who works sort of in the financial services space, the reality as a result of COVID is that we don't really need to be in our offices. And so the biggest change for me has been the fact that I've been working from home pretty much since uh, COVID broke out. And actually sort of in my discussions with my boss, it seems like we're not going back to the office until, you know, sometime mid 2021. And then when we do go back, probably on a three day basis, as opposed to the traditional sort of five work, five day work week in the office. Uh, and so obviously I think there's some challenges, but also some immense benefits to working from home that I think diabetics in particular can capitalize on, whether it's just having more free time, ability to prepare your lunches better, um, or just being able to work out in the middle of the day and not have to time it or, or, or push those things towards the end of the night, uh, at which point sort of it becomes a little bit more choppy as you manage your, your health. So I'm sure we'll dig in on all of those things later on. Great, guys. Thanks for, thanks for those introductions. And Mikhail, like just to kind of keep on that topic, I mean, so much, you know, I think you hit on, hit the nail on the head in, in terms of also seeing like just there's been a lot of negatives, I think, about COVID, but there's also been, I think, a surprising thing, a, a number of positives. You know, I know just even talking to some of my clients, they're actually enjoying that they're not commuting to work. They're actually enjoying having, you know, not having to worry so much about packing their lunches or, you know, finding time to fit in the gym because they can actually get a workout done at home. So I think the whole idea of having to adapt has actually brought out some positives. Uh, I know for myself, I enjoyed a lot of family time at the beginning of this, which was, you know, it was actually when they said, oh my God, you know, your kids have to be home for three weeks. I was like, oh, ah! And that, you know, it's turned into like seven months, but, but it was actually nice. And, and for you, um, kind of moving into the second wave, have you, have you found like that your fears and anxieties have changed at all, gotten better, worse? Yeah, no, absolutely. Happy, happy to sort of touch on that. I mean, look, when, when things sort of broke out for COVID, right, the, I think everyone had some level of anxiety and it's really triggered by the uncertainty about the future, what it means, right? So at the outset, it was like, how does this thing get passed on to others? Are we more or less risk? Uh, what type of things can you do to prevent it? And so there was just a lot of unknowns, especially around like the March, April, February, like that type of uh, time frame. Uh, but the reality now, I think, is that there's clearly a path to sort of, uh, or sort of, there's a path to normalcy and definitely a path, uh, sort of a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Whether it's vaccine or you know, people just treating it more be better. And if you, in the off chance that you do get sick, the reality is that sort of the care that is there now is much better than it was at the outset. And so to be completely honest, um, not to like belittle COVID, but I think uh, like my anxieties have actually disappeared over time because we just get more certainty about what the nature of the beast is. Uh, and obviously we found out that in some ways it's worse than what we expected, but in a lot of ways it's, it's, it's better, right? And um you know, that's kind of the place that I find myself at right now is that I look to the future and I'm hopeful in the fact that, you know, there is a path in 2021 to normalcy and it feels like we're closer than ever to that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I know when we first, when it first started, they were like, you know, you got to wash your groceries and I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Kyle. It's back at the beginning, there were so many unknowns that we didn't really figure out so everything we're all extra extra cautious and kind of being a lot more careful but since time has passed we know more and we know there's hope there's fact there are vaccines coming in 2021 and we know that the treatment has improved that has certainly lowered my anxiety but i'd say the only fear that might have increased for me is more for the well-being of my family knowing that they're living in a region where covid is a lot worse now in terms of numbers than it was back in March. So that's probably where my biggest fear lies. So I, in terms of dealing with that, I think just staying in contact with your family online or talking to them and just kind of like, just knowing what's going on in their lives is important to uh, kind of bring those concerns down a bit. Just staying in contact, I guess, is probably the best that you can do in that case. 
Uh, Mikel and, and Luca, thank you. And, and thank you really for, for starting us off. I, I think we've We've really started off um, with, with a lot of different um, strategies and, and um, feelings about when COVID first came around, well, what were we really thinking and, and what will the future look like? And I'm curious for, for our panelists, um, when you think about a few months ago when um, we were kind of declared that, that we're in pandemic, um, a, a few areas were already in, in lockdown. Um, how did your routines change uh, back in March and, and in April? And if they did change, how are they looking like now as, as we enter into the second wave? Um, have you learned something about yourself? Ha have you um, changed something about your routine that, that actually you, you would like to share with us and, and share that maybe it, it was a benefit for you? Um, but also if, if you were having times that, you know, at first it was a bit uncomfortable, we, we would welcome you to share that as well and then share some of the strategies that, that you um, incorporated into your routine. So maybe I'll, I'll ask you, Janet, to start us off. Yeah, for sure. So I was fortunate enough to be told that we're all working from home, take your computers, uh, and it was, a little bit strange at first, even just adjusting to that. Uh, phase one, I was I was sticking to my usual work hours, get up early, and then I realized that as I had some additional stresses of all of those unknowns, that I needed the sleep. So I actually shifted my time frame by removing that those two hours of commuting out of my day. I was able to really find time to focus on me which is something that I think probably a few other panelists have found as well, is that two hours out of your day can actually be a lot. Uh, whether that was meaning that I could actually take time to prepare myself a proper lunch and snacks instead of throwing something in the lunch bag and running out the door. Uh, and just that flexibility within my day has been really good. Uh, sometimes I'm able to squeeze a workout in at lunch have a shower and then go back into my afternoon meeting. During the work day when I was back in the office, that was, I could maybe go for a walk and return back to my desk sweaty. Uh, but I found that I've really, like my anxiety has gone down once my team said, we're working from home. This is how it's going to be for a while. Uh, the, then everything gets set up more prop like properly and I even have the more ergonomic tools at my desk. At first, you have footstools, you have makeshift desks to try to make your workstation function. And that actually wears down on your physical and mental health when you're sitting kinked up in a weird space. So as phase two here, I know I'm comfortable working from home. I have regular chats with my team. We're always checking in on each other. And I've gained those two hours within my day to try to either teach a fitness class, just do a workout and just really focus on finding time for me. So can I just say, uh, Janet, or to anybody who wants to, to share here, um, how are you like, how are you finding that you're able to keep work time, work time and lifetime, lifetime? Like I know, I think for a lot of people who are working, you know, real jobs from home, or even students, because a lot of you guys are in school, you know, when you're going to class, you're in class, but when you're, you know, when you're home, it's your time. And are you finding it challenging to separate? And, and I think, you know, are you, are you, are you able to strategize, you know, this is my, this is my meal time. This is my work time. I should get up and eat now. I should, you know, leave my desk or is it all kind of like flowing into one where you're sort of like working till nine o'clock and the day has drifted off? I mean, how are you? Making yeah, I guess I can answer that. So I feel like all the days have kind of blended into one and it's really hard to distinguish time, like free time, school time, work time. Um, but I think as a student, like everything is pre-recorded for us. So we can watch it at any time, especially because we have a lot of international students. Um, but having said that, it kind of feels like they're giving us more work because we're more free. 
So we have a lot more on our plate to, to figure out and finish. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it always comes down to like, can you manage your health and also the, the task at hand that you have to accomplish. Um, and to me, I find that I kind of take more time in the morning to work on myself and my health, like working out, eating well, um, and getting a good rest. And then I kind of take care of the work later on since the time kind of blends together. Um, so I'm finding myself like staying up later uh, to finish work, but then I'm also sleeping in a little bit more uh, and just focusing on my health, like going for walks every morning, um, calling family members and so on. I definitely know what you mean. The borders between work and free time kind of, they don't exist anymore. You're like a few seconds away from not working and working at the same time. So it's really, it comes down to how you feel and if you can kind of discipline yourself to get your work done while also being able to balance out or take time out for yourself when you need. So I, I'm just trying to say, I understand what you mean, Mark. <laughs> wondering uh so mark you had mentioned that now you're taking the morning to kind of do your thing um i hear that you've incorporated that into your routine um do you think that's sustainable as as we move into wave two so the, the only issue i'm finding right now is that as it's getting colder it's harder to to get outside and kind of get everything done um I thought about getting a dog and then I realized like when things go back to normal, it might not be sustainable. Uh, although right now it's like the perfect opportunity to, to do so. Um, but yeah, I definitely think now that we have to stay more indoors, like I'm doing more like body weight exercises, uh, gyms are closed. Um, and as time moves on, you know, like it's darker for most of the day. So I, I try to use that time where there's like a lot of light out to kind of like go to my window at least and kind of get some fresh air. Um, but other than that, I, I'm using all the time where it's like dark to finish all my work. And I mean, in terms of this specific, you know, the panel, we're talking, you know, to people with diabetes here. I mean, Mark, you can comment on this as well in terms of your routine shifting or anybody really like, has this impacted your diabetes management um, at all in terms of like, now I have to take my insulin at a different time and that's in impacting my sugars or has it just been kind of easy to, to transition into a different kind of schedule? I think sitting a lot is a pretty hard hitter on blood sugar. I think especially if you have classes all day and you're just, you lose all the, um, before if you were in person, you'd be walking from class to class every hour and a half. You might have a conversation with a friend or something, but you're always kind of moving throughout the day. Now you have to, like, it, it's not natural to just, well, I mean, you have to still try to make that movement natural by allocating some time frames to go out and run or exercise. So, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't say like I have a perfect routine. I would say like my routine kind of changes week by week, how you feel. It's really, it's really fluid. Um, especially since you have to book uh, going to the gym, maybe like five, six days in advance. So, slots fill up sometimes you book late so it's almost impossible to keep a routine except around things that don't change like class times and depending on how strict you're about when you go to bed things like that so has that been frustrating for you or has that been are you feeling like i mean does that is it's okay i honestly i really like the fluidity of having a flexible routine like there's a backbone obviously so there's like these are the things that you have to hit in your day or in the week. But to, I like that I can do things when I feel like I want to do them and not just force myself. Like, oh, now is the time to do this. I have to do this. Sometimes it's kind of like, well, let's just take it easy. Do it at your own pace. And I think that's, the, that's given me the least amount of stress to kind of go about my days that way. I don't know if anyone else feels the same, but that's my experience especially since I'm uh, living in a completely new environment. I don't know, a lot of people, I think, have moved out for university and kind of got that experience a little away from home for probably when they were like 18 or 19. But now this is my first time kind of living away from home for about a year and just totally new surroundings with everything shut down is definitely takes a toll on your mind. So you have to uh, 
really do what you can to minimize the stress and do do the best you can for your blood sugar. I wonder, um, Mikkel, if you wouldn't mind sharing, uh, so we've heard, you know, folks are going to the gym when it's safe to do so and, and you can book some time slots in. Uh, Mark had shared uh, some you know, going outside, uh, but it's getting cooler and, and darker. I, I wonder, Michaela, if are you staying active uh, outside right now? Do you have any um, fitness that you're doing at home that, that you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the thing that's sort of probably different around about me is just the fact that I started working out pretty much over the course of COVID. So that's really for the first time in my entire life where I've taken it seriously enough such that I'm like cranking out, you know, four, five, six workouts a week on a consistent basis. And I mean, um, I think there's a couple of things to say about that. One, I think it takes a while for you to build good habits, right? Especially ones that are difficult, you know, depending on which book you read, the answer is it's either 22 days of consistent work or 66 days of consistent work. But the reality is that it's a certain number of days that you have to do things before they become habits, right? And I went through that cycle over the course of COVID. And the good news about me going through that cycle over the course of COVID is that it, gyms weren't open for the majority of that time. And so I've had to learn to work out outside. And so over the course of the summer, that meant running. Uh, and I've sort of really ramped up my running worse towards like peak summer. I was running something like 40 kilometers a week, um, broke out into like four or three sessions. Uh, but now obviously with, with winter being here upon us, we have to find other ways to do that. And just going outside is just not nearly as much of an option or nearly as much of a feeling option as it was before. And so the answer to that really for me is free weights, right? So I just, I, at this stage, I've realized that I actually don't think I'm going to go back or sorry, I'm not, I'm never going to go to the gym. I don't think, and I've never really started there. So I don't have no urge to come back to it. And I've managed to pretty much get all my workouts done at home. And that requires a combination of at-home equipment, right? So there's some upfront costs there, no question. It's a pull-up bar, it's free weight, depending on how expensive you go. They're both flexes, so you can switch quicker or some more cheaper things that you spend more time fiddling around with them. But look, the reality is all of this can be done at home. Uh, and it's probably the setup cost is the equivalent of what is otherwise an annual membership, like gym membership subscription. And so that's kind of the two cents about me is that I think I'm going to continue to be active and continue to be active at home. Uh, and the reality of sort of working from home with someone who's being a young professional means that I can now fit in my workouts in periods that otherwise just weren't ever possible before. And that means working out in the middle of the lunch or uh, at two o'clock or, you know, trying to do some kind of at home hit workout. And, you know, I had lunch and my, my blood sugar is spiking. I banged up my insulin. Like now's the time for me to get my blood sugar going. And so, for what it's worth, you know, for all the negatives that COVID has introduced uh, into a lot of people's lives and myself including, the one big positive has been just the flexibility to do my workouts at a time that are convenient to, for me, uh, especially in the role that I'm in today. I definitely 100% agree with you, Mikhail, in that I, if I can plan my workouts based on what my blood sugar is doing, if all of a sudden I'm having a stubborn high, I go, oh, maybe it's time to get up and move a little bit. I can come back to my desk later. And I think that's one of the flexible, like the beneficial flexibilities is that we can, it allows me to almost plan a little bit easier. Uh, and I, I used to go to the gym multiple times a week, but then once COVID hit and it was shut down, I started finding online workouts, different on Instagram and Facebook, find, finding people to connect with. And then eventually I ended up finding those time within my day to get my certification. And now I myself am teaching virtual with my friends, like slowly trying to build my circle because I, I'm not with that gym who's posting classes. So it's been a bit of a struggle there, but then having a, even two regular people, I put that time on the schedule and I know I'm doing workout at this time. I'm able to plan my dinner or my lunch dependent beforehand. So that way I'm not having my spiking insulin. I'm two hours before or eating a low carb. I haven't gone low during a class yet, which is good. I had the one time where I threw in a different time slot. And of course you don't plan properly. Anxiety kicks in and then I was high by the end and deal with the crash a couple hours later. So even just finding those times that work best for you in terms of the food within the day and 
just the, the way your hormones are spiking in the morning. I know some people do best in the morning, others later on in the day, and it affects your sleep. But I've found like you've I've got to experiment with more times of being of activity within my day to really adjust my insulin, even including those like lunchtime walks or but yeah, I definitely get up and move if I realize my blood sugar is getting high from sitting so much. Interesting stuff here, guys. Like it's so interesting to hear how all of you are handling these different situations. Um, you know, and on that point, like I feel like too with social media being maybe more present in our lives and there's so much messaging out there about how to stay healthy and how to stay motivated and um you know, even just listening to what my clients in my practice are seeing with being home and access to food is different for the better, for worse, you know, having your pantry there and maybe not having as much access to going out to eat, which could be good, which could be bad. I don't know. It depends, you know, with all of the different recommendations out there about, you know, sugar and, and fat and calories and, you know, staying healthy and managing your diabetes and all of the mixed messages and then add social media to that, which I feel like, I don't know, during COVID, because we're all, you know, on our devices more has been even more present in our lives. How are you, I mean, how are you guys feeling about your nutrition, your nutrition status? Has it changed? Has it stayed the same? Um, is it easier to make healthy choices? Is it harder? I think, Mikhail, you were mentioning a little bit about, um, not you know like not having to pack your your meals as much and and having like access to food when you want to eat it and and that was making it easier what is what is some of the what are some of you guys thinking on that topic yeah i uh, i completely agree I, I think um even before i was in school i was on co-op when uh, COVID first hit and uh, I found that staying at home, like I was eating less out. Uh, I wasn't going to like to McDonald's for lunch. Um, although I kind of do miss the walk when you walk around for lunch to find your favorite food spot. Uh, even not being in school, like when I'm living away in school, I'm living off of KD and, and you know, like French fries and, and whatnot. Uh, but being home, like I'm really trying to like balance my diet, eating a lot of chicken. Um, since I'm like working out, I'm trying to make sure I'm eating healthy as well. Whereas like when you're living away, uh, you don't really... You really don't have that time to kind of balance everything and, and manage it all. So do you, think uh, so think, cooking, do you think your cooking skills have kind of improved out of necessity in this experience? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, I'm definitely using a lot more spices, uh, less frozen food, um, you know, boiling water properly. All my pasta is al dente now. So yeah, it's going well. What about you, Luca? What was your, like, have you, have you found a different groove here? Are you making cooking more at home or was that always something that you were doing before? I always kind of cooked at home, although I will never cook as well as my parents can. So it's still a work in progress, but I have found the time to kind of set aside on the day to make something uh, a little healthier. I, I tried baking bread when I first moved and I realized homemade bread is so bad for my blood sugar. I was really sad because I was really happy and the bread was super good, but it was just not, it, it's not sustainable. But I found, I don't know, I, I do this little thing, I like cut up an avocado with some tomato, onion, cilantro, uh, maybe some lime, salt, pepper, oil, and it takes like five seconds and then you just, throw it on the bowl and you have like a perfect little snack. So I've been doing that often enough to kind of find a way to eat healthy. But even then, like I can't pretend and I probably most of us can't pretend we're all perfect food role models, but as long as like you can take some time to think about it and maybe even if you have a roommate or you live with someone cooking together can also like, teach you a lot about healthy eating. Yeah. So far, so good. I've, I've been managing. Janet, what about for you with, I mean, I know um, we both have celiac here on the panel and I don't, something's going on with the Udi's bread. Like, I don't know where that is. It's like off the shelves and has never returned. Have you been finding, or any of you been finding like out in different locations that um, 
access to food has been harder or or that certain products are are not not in stock or anything like that i mean early on in covid i think that was more of an issue with people hoarding but so i'm actually currently in the midst right now of trying to locate um worcester sauce that is gluten free uh, because a lot of it usually isn't. So I am currently on a hunt for that and I might have to just try to find and order a big jug online and divvy it up amongst friends. <laughs> I've, I've been doing a lot of grocery pickup orders. So I sit down with my boyfriend and we're able to sort of think about what meals do we want for the week. And that's a, that little bit of meal planning, even though we may not pinpoint it completely is helpful. At the beginning, there was definitely shortages of a lot of those staples, but I haven't noticed many things other than my sauce right now uh, <laughs> that are lacking. But, and like in terms of just eating out more, I like I never ate out a whole lot, uh, but I always have been trying to support a local restaurant to help because they are still trying to stay in business. So I try to eat out maybe once a week, once every two weeks and being celiac, there's not as many unhealthy options, I find. Uh, everything is more like homemade foods and some of the sauces that everyone would usually add that are definitely evil on the blood sugars, those aren't in the uh, gluten-free dishes all the time because then we have to stick to more vegetarian some options. Uh, but yeah, I having someone else at home, like Luca said, it definitely helps you with your cooking habits as well. Or sometimes I'm super busy with work and a meal will be a meal will be made for me and it's, do you want this? Or so having someone else has definitely been helpful in terms of my eating habits because I would probably be eating crackers and cheese too many times a day to call it a meal or a bag of popcorn, which not the greatest. <laughs> you know, uh it's sometimes we have those days so i i'm so happy that we can safely share that uh, among each other and i don't think there's a perfect day uh, around our sleep our food our physical activity uh, our social interactions that we have and and the different relationships uh, that we have with our work colleagues or our family and our friends um, so although i i love chatting about food um, I'm wondering how are you de dealing and, and managing uh, with your friends and family in this COVID world? Um, and, and has it been tough to, to virtually connect? Um, what are some things that have helped you stay connected? Um, would love to hear from you. Uh, maybe Mikel, you can start us off. Yeah, sure, of course. So. Again, I think I'm maybe it's my personality, but I always look for the for the benefits and the positives and everything, right? And uh, you kind of have to contrast them with the negatives. But look, the obvious reality of COVID is that depending on kind of where we are in the cycle and what restrictions are in or not in effect, it obviously limits our social circle in terms of in-person meetings, right? And so that's the obvious negative. But then the not so obvious positive is that you're able to actually maintain relationships by reaching out to a larger array of people and using more your time more um, like better by you know not having to commute to see somebody, for example. And so really like if before, for example, to maintain a relationship, it didn't seem that normal to just do like a video conference call or a face or a FaceTime once a month, once a week, whatever the frequency is, now I think it's become a much more acceptable, socially acceptable way to stay in touch. And so what that means is that if before, you know, you would have to go out and meet your, all your friends for an evening, and that would be one evening where you would see everybody. Now you can break it up into these 30 minute short intervals where you just talk to people and you're able to cover much more ground. And so, you know, I think that's kind of how I've been managing. And in fact, in a lot of ways, I've tried to find ways to like kind of increase the uh, sort of the social velocity, if I can call it that, of all different people that I'm able to talk to on a weekly, monthly basis. And so that's sort of been the biggest change for me is just people being much more accepting of electronic formats of communication. And, you know, if at first it felt awkward, now it feels very natural. You should coin social velocity. That's, 
a really good way to put it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to share, but I have, um, because I'm on a, I'm living on a campus uh, in a, with a class of about 30 people, and there's only roughly eight of us that are actually here on campus. The rest are all over the world. So we have this little bubble that we can study together, work together, and that's basically the limit of our bubble. So every few weeks, since our courses are only about a mm -hmm. month long, we will always get together or like have a brunch or spend some time together. So even though it is more than just like two people in your bubble, it is really an isolated bubble. And I, I think if you have like a small circle like that, really it's as, as much as you can like still stay connected with everyone else, like Mikhail was mentioning, it's, it's important to really put a lot of attention into the people you do see in your daily lives as well. I think that's definitely helped me to hold on, keep my wits together. Yeah, I definitely, at the beginning, you, all, everyone, we were all finding like ways to be learning Zoom and all the different technologies to have these video chats. Uh, now during this second phase, we're all used to it. Sometimes I feel we almost have too much screen time. Uh, and But I still try to like find times to schedule chats in with friends or video chats with the family because they live further away and, and had to break it to them that no, I'm not coming home for Christmas, <laughs> uh, which I think will be the reality for a lot of families this year is that it's going to be virtual Christmases. And I think we've at least worked well on being able to get a lot of grandparents and such who maybe aren't as tech savvy to learning how to use that. Otherwise, they always love when I just pick up the phone and call them. They get super excited because it's also human interaction, although not in person within their day. And I've had different phone calls and telehealth appointments for everything. So even like my where you normally go drive to an appointment, I save that time and we're all in this virtual world, which it was a good push, I think, because a lot of the time you sit in an office for 20 minutes waiting and unfortunately your appointment is only like two minutes long. Uh, so I definitely have enjoyed being more online to an extent, but nothing beats in the summer when I was able to actually go on a socially distanced like hike with friends and see them in person. Uh, Janet, I, I just picked up on, on something that you had said around uh, appointments and how now we, we've sort of moved into a, a different world around how our, our healthcare appointments look like. So I, I'm wondering, I don't know, Deb, if, if you wanted to share a story and then the, the rest of our panelists, um, how has your diabetes care changed uh, in the COVID world? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, our, my initial, like my first appointment during COVID uh, that happened back in April, um, ended up being by phone and it was actually like super convenient and uh, not bad at all. So we were able to manage. And I think like speaking to all of the technology that we have with, with decks and sensor data and sharing and all of that stuff, I mean, certainly I think made it easier for me to be able to have like her to have access to that without you know having to bring in a log book like you know we might have had to do in the past so and i'm not even super you know i'm not into all the tech stuff necessarily but um as it turns out this this uh just just a couple weeks ago i had another follow-up with her just like my regular four-month appointment and we did it by phone again sort of by choice um and it actually motivated me to put in a sensor you know because i because I hadn't been wearing one and I was like, you know, I'm talking to her, so I should, you know, put it in again. And it was just so convenient that I could do that and, and it, you know, actually just send her the information and know that she could see what I was doing, even just a week's worth of data. So um, it just is so possible. And I mean, in my own practice, I really transitioned well into virtual care, which I wasn't doing that much of before, but like, I think Mick McHale was saying, 
um, now that this has become just sort of the norm, um, it's not, people aren't seeing it as second best to see you virtually. It's, it's actually people are seeing it as, oh, now I don't have to drive there or now I can actually fit in that appointment because it's going to be an hour start to finish rather than it, you know, being closer to two hours by the time you factor in commute time and parking and all of that other stuff. So I think that there's, you know, definitely going to be changes and benefits to this um, from the healthcare perspective. And I mean, a lot of people living on the outskirts of cities have to travel far distances to see their specialists. So I think, you know, it might actually increase um, compliance to, to seeking out uh, health professionals and care rather than having to always come in for appointments. So I don't know if any of you guys have also experienced that. Could definitely say the phone call is much easier than going in. I feel like it avoids a lot of the, yeah, just waiting around and commuting and then you come in and here's my data. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. See you in six months or a year or whatever it is. So it, it definitely saves a lot of long time. I was actually kind of wondering a little bit about how you guys feel compared to your peers when it comes to, you know, motivation is is always high on the list of reasons not to do something you know people like Mikhail was saying find it difficult to make behavior changes and lifestyle changes and you guys seem like crazily <laughs> you know well adapted I would say you've all really sound to have been successfully able to strategize and make changes um, and really implement and act on you know the opportunities and and the challenges and everything that have been presented so do you think that having type 1 diabetes has made you better at, at staying motivated or or made it easier to sort of stay motivated compared to your peers who might be kind of in your in your in your groups in your circles i think as type 1 diabetics in like maybe be, um, because I've been diabetic for so long, um, we're really resilient and like we're used to adapting to change. So when you just say, hey, here's a different routine within your day, that was happening even pre-pandemic that we were needing to find that motivation to adapt and try to take care of ourselves. And as we know, if we do get sick, it takes that like the better control we're in to start with is the better outcomes that we're going to have. So I think that definitely does give probably a little bit of motivation is that I want to make sure that I am in my strongest state in case I get anything at all. Uh, Cause even pre pandemic, it was always, I need to make sure I'm ready to fight the flu or I need to even a simple like cold can sometimes escalate if you're not taking care of yourself. So I think having type one definitely like is a that extra little internal motivation because I've almost just been pre-programmed to adapt to change and fight through everything. May I wonder maybe another panelist has the same thought. Do any or... you think that diabetes makes you take fitness too far sometimes? I I, I don't know. I I just always for myself when I think about staying fit, I felt I had to be very extreme about it and probably exercise more intensely than before. And I noticed, I don't know if others have seen this, but I'll do a workout and I'll be just like sweating and completely exasperated by the end. And I'll have a protein shake or like something without any carbs. And then my sugar will just all of a sudden go crazy sky high. Like I'll have to bolus just to bring down the adrenaline and any other hormones that come out while you're working out. So I don't know if anyone else has felt like maybe fitness extremism, if diabetes has pushed them towards that. 
I mean, uh, I'll share slightly on topic, but slightly off topic, but definitely touches on the two things you guys have mentioned. But I think, like, I'm happy and fortunate enough to have lost a decent chunk of weight over the course of COVID. And it's obvious why I did, why I did it, because I ramped up the amount of cardio that I do. And obviously, that just started burning a little bit of fat and, like, my body fat went down. And the most consistent comment that you get from people when you go through this sort of uh, transition is, like, A, you look great great and then the follow-up is always you must feel great right and what i found is that the way i feel actually hasn't changed even though i am 40 pounds lighter but what has changed is the fact that i'm using 30 percent less insulin than i used to what has changed is that my a1c's are now lower what has changed is that i'm much more likely to go low overnight or i'm now much more worried of a low overnight than i and before it was for some reason the highs that tend to, that tend to go up right and now with sort of the pump technology where it is, you know, sort of I'm on, I'm in tandem, but the reality is that I'm much better at controlling the overnight low because it's able to shut off my insulin at a certain point in time. And so all of which is to say that, um, you know, you do have this additional layer of, you know, everyday fitness definitely increases all sorts of metrics throughout your body, but it has a very tangible impact on your day-to-day -day diabetes management. And it gives you more control over your body. Um, and, you know, that's definitely something that I went, that I went through and sort of to tie it off to Lucas point, I think, you know, yeah, there's, there's, there's reasons to push yourself further as a result of diabetes, but it will only give you benefits that I think other people will not be able to realize. I think that's well said. Yeah, uh, and I think, sorry, just to touch on one more layer, I think I've also always been the type of person that previously when, when I would, get some kind of fitness advice from my endo it was something i ignored because it just wasn't active and i think i want to caution everyone and, and be very clear that when you do go through the transition of sort of ramping up your activity level that you have to do the do it with a very conscious effort because it does have a very specific impact on your blood sugar and all the advice that i've been ignoring suddenly just started rushing back to me when i'm in the middle of a run and i just took some insulin and i found out that the runs forced like my body to absorb insulin at rates i didn't think were possible before right um so, but that type of, that type of thinking has also led to new discoveries, such as, you know, when you have a high at home and you realize you can go for a walk and this 20 minute walk in combination with insulin is actually going to be able to bring your sugar down more effectively than almost any other tool that's out there for you today. Right. Um, and so, you know, I definitely encourage everyone to be active, but I think not only because of losing weight and for looking and feeling better, but also for just having more tighter control about your diabetes management and, if you feel like you're the type of person that is already doing everything you can, well, maybe this is like an extra layer that you can introduce uh, that you just haven't considered before. Mikael, beautifully said, um, and, and really panelists so far, I'm, I'm just so honored uh, to hear from all of you, but I have a question. Uh, so maybe I'm someone, I'm, I'm not physically active, I... I really have eaten out most of my life, my sleeping pattern, you know, I, I, I'm up until 3am, I have so many assignments to do. And uh, the next morning, I, I grab a large coffee. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that that those are bad things, but ju just maybe not the smartest choices in my life right now. Could you offer me some um, advice, not medical advice, but just some tips around um, how to stay healthy and, and active um, while we're living with type one. So I'll go first. And my first tip would just be start small. Uh, you don't have to change everything overnight, uh, even just starting with drinking more water. So like have, carry, carry a water bottle around with you, have it at your desk, because that'll even just help with so many things when you're more hydrated. I know when I'm busy, sometimes you forget to have some and then you get those headaches and then you crave the sweets and then you just don't want to do anything. Uh, so, but like, don't change everything at once and finding activities or someone to kind of almost hold you accountable if you do want to start exercising. I know a few friends have, they get up in the morning, they call each other on Zoom and they do a video together. Uh, so like even just finding someone who can help hold you accountable. And if you know that that person's waiting for you even bef before work or 
at lunchtime or in the evening, like that you will find a way to make sure that you're there for them. And then it also gives you some social time too to help with your mental health. You mean the all or nothing attitude doesn't work, Janet? I agree with Janet. It's exercise doesn't have to be a competitive thing. Exercise could almost be a, just a casual part of your day. And I think you need to treat exercise, if, assuming you want to exercise more, treat it as sort of like an avenue to escape from your daily routines and thoughts. For myself, at least, I don't know, listening to music or lifting or just completely getting and focusing on one thing, just diverting all your energy to that, that is so good. And when you get that sensation of escape, even though it's something that could be totally casual, like a 15 minute jog, you get, you still get endorphins. You still get that sense of satisfaction and clarity that can help you with essentially everything else, sleeping better, thinking better and all that. So as Janet's suggesting, you know, keep it casual and let it be your way to escape. Yeah, just to add on, like before gyms were closed, I was the type of person to, to work out at least five times a week just because it was my getaway. Uh, now I'm finding that because gyms are closed and, you know, at-home workouts aren't really the same, at a, minim at a minimum, sorry, I'm trying to stretch more. And uh, I'm trying to just move my body or, or trying to get active in some way, like walking to the mailbox or just stepping outside for some air. You really feel a self, a, a self uh, you feel self-accomplished is what I'm trying to say. And you really uh, get more out of your day when you, when you start it by, by doing something active. And I don't know if anyone works out with other people, but it's definitely nice to have someone else sort of be a stakeholder in your exercise and fitness life, right? Suffer together, it's easier than suffering alone. <laughs> yeah, if I could just add one last thing is that I think, you know, Consistent exercise, as I've learned, uh, is that it's it's almost like a this really positive feedback loop, right? So you you but it starts in a in a in what I think is not the most pleasant way. It's you having to force yourself typically to do something, after which you may not have like the greatest feeling the day or the week after, whether it's like hard workout, right? Like you your muscles hurt and it doesn't feel like it's something that's pleasurable, but and that's what sort of the force of habit comes in, right? So you have to, at some level, power through that to kickstart this positive feedback loop of feeling stronger, feeling better. And then before you know it, you reach a point, at least I, I've certainly reached it and I hope it never goes away, but I'm also sounding like a rookie who's also worked, only worked out for six months in his entire life, but it is what it is. But you do start this feedback loop where you crave the workouts because you know the type of results that they give you and the results that they give you are those of you feeling great and you feeling energized and just sort of uh, better than you were before, right? So if at the beginning it feels like you're working out and you're forcing yourself something that doesn't give you any benefits, uh, you just have to trust the process that it will kick in. And then at a certain point, the feedback loop only gets better because you feel better, you feel more confident, uh, you might look better. And so all these different layers just sort of compound to the point that you just want to do more of it. Um, and I'm happy to find myself in this state today and we'll see you know, how, if, if it's going to hold or not. But at least even going through this once has been an extremely rewarding experience for me. Before I uh, say thanks to everybody, I'll share my last tip around that. I think um, for me, the, the most important part of getting started with something is just like, making a list of all the barriers and then attacking each one, one at a time. So like if I tell somebody that they want to get meal prepping or they want to have more meals prepared, the first thing they have to do is they have to have Tupperware. So like you have to go and get your Tupperware because if you go to meal prep and then you don't have your Tupperware, it's going to be frustrating. And it's the same with the exercise. I think like you want to do a home workout, but you don't know what to do. So you're like, you wake up tomorrow ready to go but you don't have the shoes and you don't have your space set up and you don't have the weights that you need and you don't know what program you're going to follow. So I think even taking that week to kind of prep yourself when you're in that stage of contemplation or motive motivation is to kind of organize yourself so that when you are ready, you have everything that's going to facilitate it being a positive experience rather than a frustrating experience. Um, so that was my, that was, that's my little tip, but I wanted to uh, 
I really want to thank, I mean, I, it's already eight o'clock. I can't believe how quickly time flies. Um, thank all of the amazing panelists. You guys are seriously accomplished uh, folks and doing a great job with your diabetes. And um, thank you for taking the time to chat with us tonight. And I think for everybody out there that did tune in tonight, thanks for tuning in and your interest in this, in this webinar. And I think it's just important to know that even though we are isolating, um, you're not alone and, and the Diabetes Hope um, Foundation wants to make sure you know that there's people out there for you to connect with. And now more than ever, I think with virtual stuff and everything, it's actually so easy to, to get out there and, and connect with people. Um, I know Janet has been involved with the mentorship program. So if you don't know about the mentorship program, which supports um, other people with diabetes transitioning into different phases of their life, there is um, the, the, the DHF family is there and doing a lot to um, stay connected and help all, all of you guys um, to stay connected and, and get the help that you need. Um, and if you do want more information about that, you can visit the website for more details um, on how to join the mentorship program or other ways to connect with exciting things that are going on with um, DHF and other webinars that we're doing. Alrighty, and I'm again so happy to be with you, uh, all of you here today. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. And if you're joining us after the session has been recorded, hello. Uh, thanks for joining us again as well. And a special shout out and thank you to our sponsors tonight, uh, Abbott, Lilly, Medtronic, Novo Nordisk, and Yipsomed. And we will see you all next Wednesday for our Diabetes Management and Mental Health webinar. Uh, and it will start at the same time at 7 p.m. We hope you all have a fantastic evening uh, and stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us.